Okay, Bridget, go for it. Looking forward to hearing. Right, all right. Well, we look at the first picture, which is number two, I think, on yours. And um, I think I'll just start off by saying that I am the chairman of the uh, Friends of Onihunga Community House, uh, which actually operate and run this building. And you'll see how we do that um, as I go through the talk. Because it's operated as a community center. Now, this was taken in 1901, November the 11th, 1901, and that was opening day for the brand new Onihunga School. Um, it was brand new and it was designed by well known educational architects of the time. And they were, this was supposed to be the very pinnacle of their career. Of this particular building. Um, it was designed in what is called the Queen Anne style, and you can see that it is certainly very ornate. It was very modern for its time. Um, it consisted of five huge rooms and two smaller ones. Um, now, perhaps we'll go on to the next one, please, Queen. Now, this is a photograph um, of the time, and you can see that it's a very beautiful building. Especially take note of the finials. The finials are those long, those stick things that are coming out of the roof on the top of each gable. So make a note of those ones. Um, the chimneys, which were for the pot-bellied stoves that heated every room, and the bell tower. Uh, which housed the school bell. Um, yeah, so it, it housed, uh, housed the school bell. It was very modern for its time. It was so modern that uh, the colder rooms were painted in warm colors and the warmer rooms were painted in cool colors. Very, very modern, very new. We'll go on to the next one, please. The next one is a contemporary sketch taken around about the same time. And you can see it's got only hunger primary school written down at the bottom. Lovely Edwardian dresses. Uh, I believe this was used as a postcard because the residents of only hunger were so thrilled and delighted with this beautiful new huge school that it was promoted in every possible way. Right, next one, please, Lee. And this is another view of the building um, taken sort of round about the same time. And again, this one was taken, this copy of this was taken from a postcard of the time. As a past teacher myself, I actually find it quite interesting because in the lower area, um, just sort of below the flagpole and to the right, you can see um, a shed that was used often in schools of that period and later, and they were referred to as shelter sheds, very common in schools at that time. In case it rained at playtime, then the children could all go into the shelter shed. Now, uh, next one, please. Now, here is a class in progress at, in this building. And I think it's very interesting for you to note uh, various things. And one is that all of the children are sitting, staring at the teacher with their hands behind their backs. They are not on the desks. They are not folded in front. They are not scratching their heads or whatever. They are sitting rock still looking at their teacher. You'll also notice that it's a very large class, possibly about 75 students. And you'll also notice that they are seated rising. That is because they were seated in tiers um, so that the children at the back could still see what is going on in the front. Also in the front desk, you can see that the children have slates and the slates were slotted into special slots in their desks so that they could stand upright when they were not actually being used. We've got a couple of these desks in our museum and you can actually see them. The other thing to know, one other thing to notice is the blackboard. Um, I think it says, Ben said the red hen. 
yes, very typical way of teaching to read through the phonics system at that period. And also standing at the back, uh, two young ladies, also with their hands behind their backs. Um, they were, and I think there's one beneath the windows at the far end too. They were called pupil teachers. And um, to be a teacher, you have to spend a year before you went to any training institution as a pupil teacher. Uh, you were partly a pupil and partly the teacher's helper. So they're obviously standing there ready for some kind of action, um, possibly when the camera is, is off. Um, next one, please, Lee. Now, here we have, again, you can see the word only hunger uh, down at the bottom. This was taken again from a postcard of the time. And you can see the children um, at some kind of school assembly. I actually think that they could not use the inside rooms for school assemblies because of the tiered nature of the seating with the desks. So uh, they had to have them outside. Next one, please, Lee. Now, for us at the community house, this is a really interesting picture. At that time, we had two teachers at the school, uh, two lady teachers, Eva and Jessie Bauer. And Eva and Jessie were very keen photographers at that time, which was unusual because photography was in its infancy anyway. And um, um, Eva and Jessie, of course, were women. Uh, they took many photographs of New Zealand. They traveled through New Zealand taking photographs, but they also took quite a few of our school. I just love the little boy on the left with the drum, with that expression <laughs> on his face, which is, um, to me is absolutely delightful. Now, Eva and Jesse, of course, were using um, glass plates for their photography. And then great nephew, who kindly donated us these pictures, said that it was common knowledge in his family that of course, they needed a dark room to change their plates every time they took a photograph. <coughs> and so what they did, not having a dark room available at the school, was one sister would disappear underneath the other sister's long dark skirts. And that provided a temporary dark room so that they could actually change the plates. Next one, please. Yeah. Another photograph by Eva and Jessie, and this time it is the side of the classroom that had the boys. <coughs> Next one, Jessie. Now I'm, I'm calling you Jessie now. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <coughs> and this is the other side of the classroom which held the girls. Again, you can see the books or slates upright. <coughs> and the Next one. <clears throat> now, from 1901 until 1982, the school was used as a school. Sometimes it was a primary school, sometimes it was a secondary school, according to the needs of the children and the, and the community. And between those, that time, it went through many, many, many changes. As you can see here, this was a photograph taken about 1992. And you can compare it with the photograph at the beginning. There are no finials. They have been removed. There is no bell tower. That has been removed. There are no chimneys. That has been removed. But what has been put on is this hideous fibrolite addition um, some of the windows have been changed and it was, it was a very sad looking story. In 1982, the Ministry of Education decided that the building should be demolished and the space could be used by Only Hunger Primary School. Only Hunger Primary School, just down at the bottom, down here. But thanks to the principal of the time, 
um, a public meeting was called and the community decided they would like to keep the building and have it used for community use. And so that happened. A public meeting was called, a committee was set up and it was run as a community facility where the community could meet and they could have meetings, they could have classes or they could do whatever it was. Um, but and this, this committee continued until about 1992 when um, trouble struck, the committee disbanded and um, the building was as you see. But the community feeling was so strong that another committee was formed and that was the one that I joined. I joined that committee in 1992. Um, but this was the building that we inherited. Um, it was in a very sad state. The paintwork was terrible. Um, much damage had been done inside. The larger rooms had been um, partitioned off very cheaply and it was not in a good state. And there were four of these additional things put on. Next one, please, Lee. Are we going on to the next? Um... Yes, we're going on to the next one. Okay. So we've finished part one. <laughs> Perfect. I'll go to part two. Okay. And you see that? I've only got part one still. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, gosh. Let's see here. Are you still seeing part one? I'm still seeing part one. Yes, I'm seeing the old building. Okay, let me go out of that. Sorry, everybody. Let's try that again. How does that look there? Oh, perfect. Yes. Uh, yes, we'll go back one, please, Lee. Okay. There you go. Right. No, this was uh, how our front door looked at that stage. Um, the restoration process has actually started because you can see the scaffolding there and these two finials have been replaced. But you can also see the terrible windows over here, louver windows over here, um, another fibrolite thing stuck on and the terrible state of the paint. Yeah, so the restoration has started. Yes, next one, please, Lee. Right, this was what our deck looked like. You can see the terrible state of the paint. You can see louver windows over here and over here, and these terrible things, fibrolite things, stuck on, and this nasty cold area over here. And this is north facing. Yes, and over here, another louver window has been put in. Right, next one, please. Uh, this is a group, uh, this is a view of inside one of our rooms. And I'd like you to note the orange and gray carpet tiles on the floor, uh, the Pinex over here, and the uh, louver windows over there, yes. But also some very happy smiling faces of the ladies with their sewing or their writing or their art or whatever they're doing. Next one, please. This is another interior shot of a different room. And again, you can see the carpet tiles. Um, they must have been very cheap ones because they're very worn out. Uh, the hideous blue paint over here and more Pinex over here. Right, next one, please. Now, this is just a shot of one piece of our car park, uh, but the whole car park looked like that. And we often had people who were not exactly breaking their ankles, but certainly caused, it caused a lot of problems with everybody who was fine. Next one, please. So this is the interior of another room showing the louver windows that had been put in instead of the lovely sash windows. Now, the restoration was not done all at once. Uh, we were a volunteer group and we had to work very hard thinking, well, what are our priorities going to be? 
And if it was going to be kept as a community for community use, we had to do something about the fate of the building. The first thing we had to do was gain ourselves a heritage assessment, which we did. We had to um, put our, um, our relationship with the Ministry of Education onto a um, more permanent footing. In other words, we only had something called an, um, a license to occupy, but now we had to negotiate a lease, a proper lease with the Ministry of Education. We also had to look for an architect who could see what we wanted to do and who could work with us. Now, this was not done uh, within a few weeks. All of this process maybe took about three or four years to get all of that underway. Um, but we had an excellent advisor at the time, and we were able to do all of that, and we were ready to start the uh, process of restoration in 2002. And this was done in stages. It wasn't done all at once, because we asked our architect to produce a plan that could be done in stages. Because as I said before, we were a community, well, we still are a community group, all volunteers on the group, and some pretty hard work had to be done. So we're now currently about three quarters of the way through the plan that was devised by our heritage architects, Matthews and Matthews, who also have done an awful lot of work for the um, city council. Right, next one, please, Lee. Right, now cast your mind back to the room with the ladies in it. This is the same room. Please note the floor, beautiful kauri floor. And please note the windows that have been restored. They are, what I, well, we'll have to call them new heritage windows. We had a marvelous builder who actually understood what we were doing. And these, these windows were all made um, to match the windows that had been left behind. So we've got this lovely, lovely room. And most of our rooms are like that now. Um, could we have in the next one, please? Now, I put these red circles on and I put them on too thick and then I, I couldn't change them. So there we go. Now, what I've circled are these marks on the floors. And they are the mark, those are where the pegs went that held that tiered seating in place. Remember, we saw that way back in um, the first one. And we saw the children sitting on different levels. And these pegs um, show what that was like. Next one, please, me. This is our new car park. We did this in 2017. All of the potholes have been disappeared. It's been dug up quite a lot and a huge amount of work done on this because even though it had been asphalt in the past, the asphalt was not for cars. It was for children running and skipping and not for cars. So we spent a huge amount of money on this car park here. Right, next one, please, me. So that would be the next one. Yeah, the next one after the car park. Yes, that'll be the next one, I think. Yes. Sure, I'll get that up. Yes. Okay. And people see that? Yeah. have to drive this. We're waiting. Are there several pages of? of of PowerPoint. It's going to be the bell tower being put back in part. It's going to be the bell tower. Get to the next page. Yep, just hang on a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the one, Lee. Awesome. There you go. Go for it. It's about <laughs> only, had a, only had a school, but why? I don't know. I didn't catch the beginning. Yes, it's only hung a school. Well, the former only hung a school. Here is our bell tower being put back in place. Uh, we decided in stage one of this operation 
was. That, uh, yeah. We couldn't put back the finials, have the place painted, and right. not put back the bell tower. Uh, it cost a huge amount of money uh, because the uh, earthquake proofing rules have changed, and so we had to have the roof strengthened. Uh, we also had to build one part on site. That part was built on the roof. This part here was built in the um, builder's work rooms. Now, to achieve that, we had to look at a huge number of old photographs, and it was us, um, John Grant from Ready Mark, and uh, Jane and Anthony Matthews from Matthews and Matthews. We studied the photographs in huge detail, and um, Anthony Matthews produced the drawing, and um, Ready Mark produced the belfry. Now, it was a great day because we told Only Hunger Primary School that it was going to happen, and they were all seated down at the front on one of their tennis courts watching it, watching it happen. They also kindly donated us the bell to go inside it because they had the original bell, even though they didn't have the tower. So they donated us the bell. And the first people to bring it were, we found the oldest past pupil we could possibly find, uh, Jean, who was 93. Mm. And we asked the newest enrollment at Only Hanger Primary School to come and be the first people to ring the bell. Well, we didn't have the, first, the newest child because the newest child dug his toes in and wouldn't do it, but we had the second newest child instead. Yes, now we had advertised hugely for the oldest past pupil. And when this was reported in the Only Hunger Community News that Jean had done this, aged whatever, 90 whatever, um, we were inundated with calls saying, why didn't you ask my uncle Alfred? He was at school with Jean and he's older. Mm -hmm. But however, they hadn't come forward. So we had the oldest one who actually did come forward. So that was the bell tower. Right, next one, please, Lee. Now, uh, remember the deck with the two hideous add-ons. We now have a lovely deck stretching from this room to that room. Two additions have gone. Uh, we've got French doors. Those are new. They weren't in the old school, but um, Anthony Matthews decided we needed them, and I think he's right. We frequently have, have um, occasions going from this room to that room. So there are people on the new deck enjoying the sunshine. So that's really good. Right, next one, please, Lee. And here is the, the building. You can see the bell tower has been replaced. The finials have been replaced. Uh, we did not replace the pot-bellied stoves, so there are no chimneys. This is the part that had the fibrolite addition on it, and that's gone. So the house, the building looks beautiful, just as good as what it looked in November 1901. Now, we now have considerable use in that building. At the moment, we have 15 groups that use it on a regular basis. Um, some use it only once a month. Some use it maybe three times a week. Uh, our usage has gone down since COVID because we were up to maybe 25 groups um, re on a regular basis. But we still have many, many, many single events going on in here. It's become a very popular place to have family events. A lot of people are finding that modern houses can no longer hold a large family event, such as maybe Auntie Hilda's 70th birthday or um, somebody's 50th wedding anniversary. And so they decide that they will use the community house. We also have a wedding celebrant who uses this frequently for weddings. Um, which is really good. Um, so, yeah, uh, but we are hoping to pick up after the COVID. Yes, we have certainly, the regular users have gone down, but there is a wide variety of them. We range from dancing groups to people like Toastmasters, or the Rover Car Club, or 
the Auckland Lego Group or the Embroiderers Guild or whatever. Um, next one, please, please. Right, now our hard work has actually been recognised by both the City Council and Heritage New Zealand. Um, we now have a Category A in Auckland Council's unitary plan and we have a Category 1 with Heritage New Zealand. And if any of you get this magazine, uh, you can see us here. They produced an article for us. This was spring 2020. And you can see it here, a class act, landmark school restored and adored. That is us. And it's in that particular one. Um, now, as well as working for the restoration of the building and um, whatever, we have concentrated a great deal on what has happened inside. Next one, please, Lee. Now, here you can see an honours board. Now, this was in the building before we started our restoration. It was donated by um, Mr. and Mrs. Buchanan, who were well-known philanthropists in Onihanga at the time. They were very fond of children, had none of their own. They established the, the Buchanan Prize. Now, the Buchanan Prize exists also in Te Papa School, um, our school, and um, Royal Oak Intermediate. The Buchanan Prize has started in 1922 and are still going. We have the two original boards. This is how we inherited them. Now you can see that this one isn't framed. This one has a huge crack and there is massive borer bore infestation as well. So now, um, we started here at 1922 and went down to 1979 for these particular ones. Next one, please, Lee. We have had these boards restored. This was the second one, which was stuck onto the side of this one. And our restorer has copied this frame to put around this one. Um, I think they look absolutely fantastic. The borer has been... The, the borer has got, they've both been treated as borer. So we have restored those and now they're in pride of place in our entranceway. Next one, please, Lee. At the back of the first one, we actually found this one. Um, and this is a very old honours board because we have to remember that there was, this was not the first school on this site. There was another one. And this is the honours board relating to that school. And it started, this now starts in uh, 1889. First prize givers were given, yes. And um, now we actually have had this one restored as well. Next one, please, Lee. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Our restorer made this frame for it which is in the outline of the other two frames and our honours board, our old honours boards have been um, displayed on that. Now, one of our very, very old um, past pupils who comes here to their annual event told me that when she first started at this school, the passageway was lined with boards that looked like that. So that would have started in 1889 and gone up to 1922. Where they are, we have no idea, but at least we have got those ones as an example of that one. Um, next one, please. Now, we have started on site um, a small museum. And in that museum, we are concentrating on um, educational educational information from the past and the present, and the more or less the social history of Onihanga. You can see a couple of huge paintings at the back. They were in a public building in Onihanga, which no longer exists. They were given to us um, in a very bad state, and we have had them restored and put proudly onto our, uh, into our museum. 
they have been painted by the sister-in-law of a former mayor of Onihanga, William Covicott, whose sister-in-law, Mabel Upton, painted these paintings. Uh, their family informed me that they believe they are one of a series of eight, which were once in the Caldicott house in Onihanga. They are no longer there, uh, but we have these two paintings. So whether or not that is true, don't know. But anyway, they were in the orphan's hall. There is something else that was in the orphan's club. Nothing to do with real orphans, but everything to do with the, um, what used to be called a glee club. But anyway, that's the interior of the museum. Next one, please. So we'll move on to the next. Oh, yes, we have to go on to the next one. Are yeah. there any questions, folks, while I fiddle with this um, for Bridget? Anyone have any questions? Otherwise. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Otherwise, we'll just move on to the next one. Um, yes, thank you. Um, is that right, Bridget? Yes, that's the one. Yes. Now, as I said, we are collecting um, educational, um, what you might call memorabilia, I suppose. We are extremely lucky to have um, most of the series of the New Zealand Graphic Reader. That was the first series, first reading series that was ever produced in New Zealand by, by New Zealanders for New Zealand children. And these were first printed in 1900. And the compilers were Mr. Purdy, headmaster of Devonport School, and um, Mr. Armstrong, who, who was an inspector of schools at the time, but had been the principal of the Thames School. And the whole thing was approved by a Mr. Petrick, who was the chief inspector of the Auckland Education Board. Uh, the series was carefully graded. I've taken a picture of the fourth box here. And, uh, it, as you can see, it has seven colored pictures. Here's one of them, and many black and white illustrations. So how lucky can the pupils get? Yes. Um, it was carefully graded. <clears throat> and the idea of producing something for New Zealand children by New Zealanders was to instill a spirit of interest in our own country as well as showing the place of New Zealand in the empire of the time and the world. So that was, that was the, um, why we had the New Zealand graphic reader. Yes. Uh, next one, please, Lee. No, um, this is a series of cards that were definitely in use in this building because we found them in this building. Uh, definitely based on what you, uh, you would say the phonic reading style. And on some of the cards, the teacher at the time has actually um, written various other sentences on the back pertaining to the ones on the front. I should have taken a photograph of the ones on the back as well. Um, these were produced in London and Glasgow in 1900, 1905. When I was researching these on Google, I found that there is an educational museum or the educational department of a museum in Chicago that are very proud of having the complete set. We have, um, we have some of some sets, but we're very pleased that we've got them because they are actually quite rare here. Right, next one, please, Lee. Uh, this is a well-known series of readers called the Beacon Readers. We have nearly the whole set of this one. And I'm sure that some of you might know the Beacon Readers. You might have learnt to read with one of the Beacon Readers. I certainly learnt, not with Kitty and Rover, but Old Farmer Law. Uh, we haven't got that one. Number five. Next one, please, Lee. 
another set of readers, and we are gradually uh, getting building up this set. This was published in 1929, and again, um, pretty New Zealand, and a lot of New Zealand schools will have used this early reading set. Um, we're building up this set, so hopefully the bits will soon. Now, now, the next one, please, Lee. Now, this is a really interesting one. This is an early New Zealand reader. It was not produced as a set. It was only produced as one. Uh, it was produced in 1895. That would be our current years, seven, five and six, for standards five and six. That would be our current years, seven and eight. And this was done under the direction of the uh, current um, Minister of Education at that time, who was Sir William Pember Reeves. And it contains, a, the whole collection is a collection of prose and poems on New Zealand subjects. Now, ours has got a very tacky cover, but I've seen photographs of other ones and you can just see that this is, they've got the Southern Cross here, and those are the pointers to the Southern Cross. So very apt for this time of the year when we're all thinking about Matariki, because this is actually Matariki. Next one, please, Lee. Now, the Cuisinier rods. Some of you might know the Cuisinier rods. This was a system devised by a Belgian teacher um, and he used, he used this in his own class in 1931, but it um, spread to the rest of the world during the 1950s. Uh, each number has a specific color. You can see the three is green, two is red, five is yellow. Each number has a specific color, which is related. Um, the first sets in New Zealand were produced in wood. And this is what we have. We have the wooden set. They were replaced later in plastic and people used the plastic. Um, the school that I was teaching at uh, instructed me to throw away the wooden set. Um, I actually didn't throw it away. I took it to the family batch and generations of children played with it in the family batch. Then when we started the museum here, I decided, no, the wooden Cuisinier is far too good to be thrown away. So here it is. And that's the original Cuisinier rods that were given to school. Next one, please. Now, as well as this, we collect, um, yes, next one, please, Lee. We collect textbooks that were similar to the graphic readers and the New Zealand reader in that they are produced in New Zealand for New Zealand children. And here is an English standard two, and you can see it's pretty well worn. And when I looked inside it, a few memories came flooding back to me and I realized, yes, I'd use that book. Now, next one, please, Lee. Now, this is uh, plain sailing. This is a textbook by a New Zealander for New Zealand children. This is the third form English course. And a couple of my friends have already told me that they recognized plain sailing because they used it themselves. Right, next one, please, Lee. I thought it was interesting to show the inside front cover of plain sailing because you can see that it was used by Margaret Wallace, Malcolm Dwight, and Leslie Higgins. I don't know which of those was the terrible speller because we've got here private. Down here, we've got a, a description on page 94, exercise three. We've got a reward if found when lost and somebody's put half in front of it. We've got keep hands off and somebody has given their opinion of the English language, which is up you. Very nice and the original price of the book, which is two shillings and six. Right, now we're going on to the next one, please, Lee.
Thank you. Uh, this is general science. Um, this is just another, another book. S.J. Lamborn, again, a New Zealander, producing a New Zealand text for New Zealand children. Next one, please, Lee. Now, we also have a collection of children's exercise books, um, which is very interesting. Uh, this is the Saxon ex exercise book, which was used um, just about all the time. I don't know that they had any others. Now, next one, please, Lee. If you don't recognize the front, you may recognize the back, um, especially the multiplication table. Many, many children found those very, very handy. Next one, please, Lee. Now, this is the inside of that same book. This is uh, Doreen Bennett's spelling book. And you can see the handwriting at the time was definitely the cursive script. Uh, very beautifully done. She was a very good handwriter. Um, the sort of roundish nature of the letters and the big spaces in between each letter. It was very common at, the, at that stage. Um, next one, please, me. Oh, and the needlework book from 1945. This is Dawn Percy's needlework book. Next one, please, me. Now, inside the needlework book are um, examples of the needlework that they were learning and doing at the time. Now, I put a key here just to wait that open because this is her example of the continuous opening. And you can see here um, at this stage, simple openings can be used for garments, et cetera, et cetera. And this is her demonstration of the continuous opening. Now, if I hadn't put that weight down, it would just look, she's done it so beautifully, it would just be a square piece of fabric. Uh, so I just opened it up a little bit to show you what she has done. All in hand stitching and beautifully done. Really, really nice. A lovely example of that kind of work. Um, next one, please. Now, we also have a collection, not textbooks, but these were handbooks that were issued to schools uh, so that teachers could find uh, teaching um, various subjects easier. This is a typical one that was given um, physical education in junior classes, typical. Uh, next one, please. And this is another typical one that was given and you can see that this was in use in 1953, um, the teaching of swimming. I think I may tell you that one of our past pupils, who was a pupil here before they had a swimming pool, said that they used to have to learn swimming even though they didn't have a swimming pool. And the teacher's method of doing this was to provide every child in the class with a bowl full of water. And they had to put their faces in the water while she counted to three. And then when she counted to four, five, six, they could lift up their heads, turn it to the side, breathe in, and then back into the water blowing bubbles. And that was how you teach swimming without a swimming pool. But whether that's in there or not, I haven't yet checked. But next one, please, Lee. An essential part of uh, school life was the dental clinic. And here is our dental clinic chair. You can see a magazine there that's got an article called Grin and Bear It. And over here, we have a case of um, dental instruments used at that stage. Next one, please, Lee. We have a lot of information in our museum about um, various past pupils who have either made their name in Onihanga or made their name in the world. Uh, this one is interesting. Um, Sir Murray Brennan, uh, is now, um, he was in standard two here in 1948, because we got him in a photograph. And um, Thomas Bavin, 
he is now a leader, world leader in pancreatic cancer. This person, he doesn't live here. I'm not quite sure where he lives, but when he comes back, he generally makes a visit to this village. Um, Thomas Bavin, um, an older pupil, uh, he was here in, in 1887, lived in New Zealand till he was 15, and uh, migrated with his family to Australia and became the, um, um, oh, what was it, the Premier, yes, the Premier of New South Wales. Uh, Vincent Meredith, uh, he was on a very, very old um, honours board, and he became um, the Crown Prosecutor, and his name is still linked with one of Auckland's very well-known um, legal firms. Uh, Vic Percival. Uh, Vic Percival forged our way to trade with China uh, and was honoured by both China and New Zealand for that. Um, Graham Mountjoy, last mayor of Onihanga and well known in local body circles. Ricky May, jazz singer um, and well known entertainer, winning many awards. And Madeline Sami, who's currently often on TV as a well known actress. Next one, please, Tony. Uh, Tony, I mean Lee. Right, well, in um, 2016, we decided we had so many well-known pupils, we actually produced our own book, uh, Legacy and Legend, with our photograph of us there. It was based on a wonderful idea uh, by our current coordinator, Tony Broad, and was actually written by Peter Verschefeld. Uh, we have several copies of that in our museum. We sold it for a while too. Yes. So next one, please. Right, um, a book called One Tree Hill by Kevin Davies. If you may be able to get the, this from the library. Um, he lived in Onihanga. He and his brother lived at the Presbyterian boys home and his, his, where his mother was a matron. He thoroughly, they thoroughly enjoyed their schooling at Manihanga Primary, and there is quite a bit about them in there. Right, next one, please, Lee. Now, as well as all of that, we have been collecting um, heritage cups and saucers. We did this because we started off having afternoon teas for fundraising efforts, and one of my friends came to one and said, your afternoon tea is lovely, but your cups are terrible. I'm going to give you two of mine and you can start collecting others. So we did. We started off with a collection of two. This is only one of our cabinets. We have about four or five. We have got up to maybe 75 cups, saucers and plates, and we can serve lovely fundraising afternoon teas on various occasions. Uh, using our Heritage China. And it's a huge thank you to all of those people who have donated their China. We are so grateful. Next one, please, Lee. Now, as well as collecting the China, we have a collection of hand embroidered tablecloths. Uh, this is only one. Um, we would have mm, probably about 30, maybe 35. These are, we have collected hand embroidered tablecloths. Um, you can see this one has used a variety of stitches. We've got Lazy Daisy here with French knots in the middle, uh, blanket stitch around the leaves, stem stitch along here, and um, hand crochet edging. I feel that these are very important. Um, it is part of the social history of New Zealand. This is something that women did um, <clears throat> when maybe it, it was a reasonable and not expensive way in order to enhance their home. And it also was something that they could do without having to the expense of going out um, somewhere else. So I think it's uh, really good. 
This is only one. Um, and we've got some, some really lovely ones. Now, next one, please, Lee. Now, during 2014, um, 2018, when there were a lot of um, activities going on around about World War I, we did a lot of research on the young men who had attended the school and not come back. <clears throat> and this is our uh, memorial to them. The ones in the middle uh, has each, each one of those men has their own poppy with their name and their number on it. And the other poppies are forming a frame and represent the other ones who perhaps did not come to the school, but certainly were living in the area. What we did was we advertised in the um, Only Hunger Community News for people who would like to knit. Um, we could provide patterns, but what we did was we asked all of the people to provide their own patterns and their own wool. And that way we got a huge variety in the color of red and a huge variety in the type of poppy that was made. Next one, please, Lee. Uh, this is a close up of uh, um, how we acknowledge those people and shows you the different styles and different colors of the poppies. Next one, please, Lee. We actually produced a small booklet on these people. Next one, please, Lee. And this is the sort of information we would have in that. Uh, we would have their name, uh, whereabouts they lived in Onihanga, in what area they served, <coughs> and when they attended the school. And if possible, uh, where their, their overseas grave is. We didn't have it for Norman. So we've just got all of the rest of the information about him. Right, there we go. Well, that's virtually uh, the restoration of the house <coughs> and what actually happens inside the building. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Hello. Uh, Bridget, it isn't a question, it's just an observation that um, even in my day, when I started a primary school, we had slates. I'm always yes. scared to say it. <laughs> yes, I thought that would bring back a few memories for people. <laughs> yes. No mention of Janet and John. Uh, no, um, I haven't got them, but um, I want them. Yes, and I badger all my teaching <clears throat> friends. I badger them. I say, do not throw anything away until I have seen it. Yes. And I know from having been a teacher that something comes in, it's the new bandwagon, everybody jumps on it, and the old bandwagon is up and it disappears. Well, don't let it disappear until I've seen it. <laughs> and that way, I have actually collected quite a few things but you can see that we are still building up our collections of various things. Um, for instance, um, if anybody has got um, a, a copy of a New Zealand Prama by William Pember Reeves uh, with a better cover, I'd, I'd really like it so that we can see the Southern Cross on it. I'd love that. So, um, you know, this is a call to you to keep your eyes and your ears open. And if you have friends or relatives, some of you may have sons and daughters who are teachers, um, take note of the sorts of things that we are collecting. I would love to get a set of Janet and John. I would love to get a set of the original 12 little books. Um, there are all sorts of things that I would really love to get hold of. I found sometimes when you were showing us those covers of the books and I wish I could see inside them. Um, yes, well, I could actually possibly, we've got a few of those books and uh, I would actually like more 
So, you know, if there is another thing that we are collecting, which is um, people's old exercise books. Uh, I do know that a lot of people, a lot of people kept them for years and years and years and years. And then when they pass on, their sons and daughters throw them away. Mm. Uh, <laughs> please put out a call for those as well, because I think it is wonderful social history to be able to look inside some of those books. Like I love the needlework book from 1945, Dawn Percy's needlework book. I think that is just stunning. Um, and it's certainly, this is social history. I think that gives you more idea about what was happening with girls, what was happening with them in 1945 than reading anything on a page in a textbook. Can I go back to your first of the books that um, mentioned fairly early on? They were the first ones produced in New Zealand for New Zealand. What year yes. was that? Um, let me see. I've got my notes here. Nineteen hundred. That early. Yes, the New Zealand graphic readers. Yes. 1900. I haven't got any Janet and John books because I was too old for them, but my younger brother started reading with Janet and John. I know. <laughs> when I first started teaching, I was teaching with Janet and John. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I also have a younger friend called Janet, but she would not let anyone call her Janet because her older brother was John and she felt funny being in the book and she yes. got teased apparently. So she called herself Jan from then on. Well, funnily enough, I had a friend called Janet whose husband was called John and she called herself Jan for the same reason. <laughs> um. But I wonder if any of you had used the textbooks of, of plain sailing. Yes, I can see. <laughs> yes. I love those books. Yes. Uh, funnily enough, somebody who came into the museum the other day looked at plain sailing uh, and said, oh, I can remember that. And they said the same thing. I loved plain sailing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So those are the textbooks that we are collecting. Um, the other things that we do collect, and, uh, uh, and I have a copy of the New Zealand educational syllabuses at the time, is that was given to somebody who, um, who entered training college. When you entered training college, you were given a whole lot of things, and that was one of them. You were given the um, educational syllabus at the time. So it's all in a huge folder. We've got quite a few things, which I didn't actually show today um, because, um, well, you know, time, et cetera, et cetera. And I wasn't sure of the interest that may or may not be shown. Yes. Mm. But virtually I picked uh, what I found interesting mm. and what I think is um, really excellent in our museum. Yeah. Take our interest to go uh -oh. and visit it. Oh, yes, uh, that would be fine. Um, it would be helpful to ring uh, to see when normally open on a Thursday, we have the museum open on Thursday mornings um, from 10, 10 o'clock oh. onwards. But it's advisable to ring because as I said, this whole place runs on volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, our person who organises the museum is a volunteer and um, comes on Thursdays. Lee, but, perhaps you could organise a visit for us? <laughs> yes, thinking that, I actually. was about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be fabulous, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. it's such a good idea. Yes. <laughs> uh, we'd be very happy to see you. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely make that a priority because that would be very fascinating. I, I, I was also, you know, I, I didn't grow up in New Zealand, but 
those napkins, you know, the, the, um, the embroider work on that. Now my, my aunt has gifted me some of hers and the quality of the, the, the material yeah. and the quality of the work, um, it's very hard to find that today, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you would find it very difficult um, to find that today, though we do have um, embroidery groups here. Uh, they don't use the place every month, um, but they do use the place maybe three or four times a year. And right. um, there is one time a year when they have an exhibition. Tell you, where's our next um, embroidery exhibition going to be? I think we've got an embroidery exhibition this, this year. I'm not. Right. Yes, Tony is just telling me, our coordinator is telling me that um, their exhibition is going to be in the last week of October and the first week of November. They've taken That's the place of two weeks for an embroiderer's exhibition. So yeah. I can let you know yes, uh, if you're you. interested in coming to that. Yes, please. Do, yes. They, uh, do they teach the same um, uh, stitches, like the oldest stitches or not? Well, they don't actually teach here. They have their own conventions here. Yeah. Um, yes, they have their exhibition here. And they have another one that happens, which is called the Embroiderer's Great Escape. And they, the embroiderers all come and the person who's organizing it has generally organized a speaker from overseas. And yeah. they come and teach something or other, yes. Mm. Yeah, it's just to restore all these uh, stitches, you know, to yes. keep it going, to teach mm. us yes. to somebody yes. new. Uh, yeah. there is, uh, um, it's not generally done on a general basis as it used to be, um, say, pre-war, when just about every woman was embroidering a tablecloth or something. Um, but there are, there's a hard core of people who do it all the time. Mm. Yes, yeah. there is a hard core of that. So it's not totally yeah. lost. Mm. Yes. But mm. I agree with you that with the tablecloths because a lot of the tablecloths are the, the uh, genuine linen, <laughs> real yes. linen. And um, oh, we've got another person join us. Yes, yes we've got a few folk have come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so a lot of the tablecloths are genuine linen. Um, and they're beautiful, really mm -hmm. lovely. Yes. Yeah. They've got a range of them, uh, some perhaps not quite so good, uh, and others are just glorious. But we keep them all because, as I said, it is social history. This is something that was very important to women in a certain part of the 20th century, and uh, we need a record of that. Mm -hmm. okay. From uh, what time is the museum open on Thursday, please? It's open from yeah. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Yes. Okay. Here's Stuart from our museum. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. He's sitting in the museum and he's showing, he's twisting <laughs> the screen. <laughs> well, I think, I think we'll definitely arrange a trip there because that would be... Um, that would be fantastic. So I will, I will be in contact with you, Bridget, with regards yes. to that. That'll yes. be wonderful. Yes. Um, Can I what just a lovely South African accent? Uh, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> you love it. I was going to say, don't get rid of it. Um, no, no, not at all. <laughs> I just was reminded of my mother. She was taught. Um, embroidering at, at school as part of one of her subjects and she won the um, competition for um, smocking and, oh, lovely. and uh, she's mum um, smocked for my sister and I the uh, tops of our little dresses how and, lovely yes, have you still she, have you still got some of those no no unfortunately no, no. Uh, people don't think to keep them but, um, there is a smocking expert in Ornihanga, and I bought a beautiful dress for my granddaughters oh. on a Saturday market outside the library. Oh, wow. Well, I must remember and I've sent it to um, Christchurch. Oh, so lovely. I, 
I, I must copy the card from her. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Stuart. So Bridget, how involved are you now? Are you still very much involved um, in the community centre? Uh, yes, because uh, when I dropped local body government, I took this up instead. Okay. Um, yes, um, I became the chairman, I think, in about 2006. Um, and um, uh, uh, just in time to start the, the actual restoration of the building. So, uh, yes, I do. I, I, work, I work here um, almost full time. Right. Uh, there's a lot to do because um, <laughs> actually I am, <laughs> I am actually the fundraiser. So, uh, you know, we've, we've raised an awful lot of money for um, a small community group, um, which is mainly volunteers. I think we've done extremely well. Mm. We've certainly fulfilled our lease obligations with the Ministry of Education. As our main lease obligation is to keep this open as a community facility, and we have done that. Our rates are very attractive for community groups, and they are supposed to pass that on to the members of their groups. Um, yes, and I think they do that. Um, so, as I said, we are hoping to build up with more regular groups to replace what we lost through the COVID. But in the meantime, a lot of people are using this for family occasions. Um, a fifth birthday party is very common here. Uh, weddings are popular. We had one lovely group, one lovely couple who came in with a young baby. They wanted their baby christened in a particular room. We didn't have that room available on the date that they wanted but we offered them another room. And they said, no, we, we'll change the date because we must have this room. Right, so it turned out that two years prior to that, they had been married in that room mm. and they wanted their baby christened in that oh. yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's almost as if- You a are of, a church. <laughs> Well, it's a lot. Of, it's almost as if a lot of people are using this building as an extension of their home. Yes. For you these occasions. Yes. Mm. I take it there's not a chapel in the building. No. 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 There's a bell tower. Yes, there's a bell tower. <laughs> Good stuff. No, we never had a chapel. Uh, no, it is an old school. That's what it was. You know, an old school. Yes. Mm. Well, as Brian and uh, Jenny have just joined us, I don't know whether they have or not, but uh, it's taped so you can see the beautiful photos of the school. Yes, yes, look out for that because I've recorded it, Brian and Jenny. I know you had an appointment to get to, and I will forward on because there's some amazing photos and um, amazing story. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So we are, I'll. I'll pass that on. It's so encouraging to hear that when communities get together, you know, the building was, was supposed to be demolished, but when communities stand together, um, what can become of that? Um, that? That I found very encouraging. Mm. I think it's when one person creates a community, and that's what Bridget has done. She has created a community. I agree. With some help. Not, um, I think much. one of the things that I started to do uh, when I did join it, because I'd had a lot of experience with, um, with community groups and my local body work, uh, was that I was out to prove that um, a community group can work. Um, a, community, a community group, just, <laughs> excuse me, just because you're a community group doesn't mean that you have to act in an unprofessional, amateur fashion. Mm -hmm. um, a community group can act professionally and a community group can achieve. And there are lots of small community groups all over New Zealand who have achieved. Um, I'm thinking perhaps of the Swanson Railway Station and um, yeah. a few things like that. Yes, uh, there's a, a, once a, you have to have the support. And I must say, I've had wonderful support from the committee. The, the committee changes every now and then. 
and our current coordinator, Tony. I've had wonderful support from uh, those people. Your handsome assistant. Um, <laughs> yes, and um, it does help if you if you have that. We also had um, some excellent advice from the beginning and an excellent person who helped us negotiate our lease with the Ministry of Education. And uh, that had to be done, otherwise there was, there was, you would not be able to earn money. You would not be able to get money because people are not interested in giving money to people who have an unsafe um, tenure of their particular building. Yes, your, your tenure must be safe. And uh, yeah, we did that. We did it. Mm. Are you actually registered as an incorporated society or as a yes, charitable trust? Yes, we are. <clears throat> we're an incorporated society. But not a trust? Yes, we're a trust as well. Mm. A trusted incorporated society <laughs> worthy of well, trust. Yeah, we've, um, I think we've done, um, we've done all right. I'm very happy with what we've done. And when you actually look at the, uh, the building that we inherited, uh, mm. which was basically a dump, um, you know, peeling paint, um, timbers falling off, uh, finials removed, bell tower gone, fibre line add-ons all over the place and very, very cheap, um, partitions put up inside and uh, goodness me you only have to look at the floor with those orange and grey carpet mm. tiles yes mm, what exactly. were the foundations like when you inherited the building excellent yes oh. Found, yes all of that had to be gone into yes uh, beautiful bu lovely foundations the the whole building is hard carry oh. Oh. wow mm. It was the pinnacle of Mitchell and Watt's career. Uh, this building was supposed to be the pinnacle of their career. The, they could have done another one. Um, there's one couple left in um, Auckland, uh, designed by Mitchell and Watt, and one of them is the Richmond Road Manual Training Centre. Yes, so that's over, over there. <laughs> yes. North. Yes, west. I think, yes. Mm. So, mm. Are there any further questions, folk? Um, I'm aware of the time. I, some, we are certainly going to, to, to arrange a visit. That's the yeah. Oh, that would be lovely. Yes, we'd love to see you. Yes. yes. Any, mm. if, any last questions? Yeah. For Bridget? Or Stuart? No. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us, Stuart. <laughs> um, well, that's it, folks. Um, Bridget, thank you so, so much for your time and uh, for sharing your knowledge. Uh, what a privilege, really. And uh, we will be in touch with those other, uh, with yeah. other for sure. Um, yes. And uh, if you have oh, any... That'll be lovely. Yes, I was we'd, we'd love to see you over here. Yeah. Perfect. If there are any questions that pop up, just um, let me know and I'll, I'll forward them to Bridget with time. Great. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. Oh, I'm <laughs> glad you enjoyed it. Glad oh, you thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you much. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Take care, everyone. See you later. Have a good, good. week. Bye. Bye.